I'm Governor. But Governor Henry McMaster is the 117th Governor of South Carolina. Prior to becoming Governor, Governor McMaster served two years as Lieutenant Governor, eight years as Attorney General, and four years as United States Attorney, appointed by President Ronald Reagan. Governor McMaster is married to his wife, Peggy, with whom he has two children, and the Governor and McMaster are all members of First Presbyterian Church of Columbia. And I also understand that they have a new addition of a dog to the family. So congratulations, and it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the Honorable Gover Governor Henry McMaster. We do have a new addition. He is right. When we got him, he was about two and a half months old, a little English bulldog uh, to replace one uh, we lost. And we've taken out that five of them. But he is now, in two months, he's grown. He's 45 and a half pounds as of two days ago, growing like a weed. Stop by the mansion one day and you'll see him. He'll lick you on the cheek. Great dog. <laughs> Y'all, thank you for inviting me. This, this is a great uh, thing, and I'm happy to be here. Mr. Mayor, we're down to thank you. You got a great, got a great place here. And uh, I was listening earlier when Dr. Taylor was, was talking. Where he going to be talking about being trustees of the future? Well, I, I guess that's what I'll, I'll tell you about because that's exactly that's exactly what we are, and what we have inherited is marvelous. And our job, as I see it, is not to mess it up. We're on the edge of the greatest prosperity that we can imagine. And what we have to do is just use our heads. There's been a lot of thinking to go on in this state by great leaders in business and academia and the churches and politics all over the place. And it's resulted in a lot of good decisions that have been made. And we're the beneficiaries of those. And now it's our job not to mess it up, but to make it stronger and pass it on to the next generation and the one after that. I got to say some of the men up here talking said they noticed that they had wives. Well, I got one too. <laughs> name is Peggy Jean. I picked out myself from Spartanburg. It's Howell Clark. Howell had not seen it yet. Hey, I picked out myself. We've been married 39 years. And y'all will love this. I got a story too. We were, I, I was on the way to, I'm a Republican. So of course I went to the Republican National Convention in the summer. And I asked Peggy on the way up, I said, Peggy, did you ever in your wildest dream, in your wildest dream, did you ever see your husband Henry going to the national convention to make it the nominating speech for Donald Trump for president? She said, Henry, I hate to tell you, but I've never seen you in any of my wildest dreams. <laughs> That's my girl. Great, great opportunity. Some of you may remember the, the poet, he's a Scotsman named Robert Burns, and he spoke a little in Gaelic or something that you have to translate him. But he said something, if you translate it, he said something like, uh, I wish the wish the gift the giver give us to see ourselves as others see us. Sometimes we are like the elephant in the circus, jumbo. City Slicker came in, saw this huge elephant, tethered with a little small chain up a little small stake in the ground. Great big elephant. But he wouldn't move from that stake. And he asked the ringmaster, what is this? He could get up and just walk off and not even know it. Why does he stay there? He said, because we put that chain and tether on him when he was a baby. He's grown up and now he doesn't try to pull it out and walk away. Sometimes we are like that. I remember the President Clemson and the President of USC said something almost in unison a few years ago. And that was, and I quote, is Jim Clements who used these very words, said, I'm tired of hearing people say that we are a small poor state and we cannot do anything. He said, I'm tired of hearing it and I don't want to hear it anymore. Well, I'm with him and Harris Pastides who said the same thing, the motto down there, is no, is, first is beat Clemson, but the other one is <laughs> no limit. So that's where we are. We, we have inherited things that you can't build these days, and, and uh, they don't exist in other states. So this is what I've learned in the last few years in 
public public office, and uh, Mark, all those offices weren't in a row, as you probably noticed, have, have been appointed by President Reagan. That was back in the 80s. So I've been in and out. I'm actually a lawyer. Is there any lawyers out there? Anybody admit to being a lawyer? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. But what I've learned in public office and trying to read as much as you can. By the way, y'all remember Jack Kemp? He was a great, great American. He said, if you're not reading at least three hours a day, you're not learning anything. And I read the other day when, uh, what's, what's the rich man out in uh, Omaha, the uh, Berkshire, what's his name? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, not Jimmy Buffett, Warren Buffett. <laughs> he said he spends 80% of his awaking hours reading. And I guess that's how he's gotten the way he is. He understands understands the world. But we are in a position with, with what we have inherited to where we are on the brink of great, great prosperity. And this, this is what I've learned over the years and has been accentuated by talking to these leaders of these companies from outside of South Carolina who come here over the years. As you know, BMW got here 25 years ago. Y'all all remember that. By the way, that's a result of a lot of real good decisions. Uh, there is forward thinking. And now the Inland Port, that's another great example of forward long-term thinking. And these people from other countries talk about that. So here's what, in a nutshell, here's what I've seen that, that we have. And that is that we have a magnificent port. Now our friends from Kansas and Nebraska and those places, they never gonna have a port. They never gonna have an ocean. There's nothing they can do about it, and we've got one. We've got one. We've got the, the outport of Charleston and the port of New York, New Jersey. Once they get dredged out, and we've already started that, our legislature wisely put up three hundred million dollars several years ago to be sure we'd have the money to start our dredging, which starts in October, by the way, to see that we were going to dredge that out. Once that is done, they're doing the same thing in New York, New Jersey. Fifteen to twenty years. Port of New York, New Jersey, and Charleston, South Carolina will be the dominant ports on the Atlantic coast. How do you spell port? M-O-N-E-Y. That's how you spell port. <laughs> and in addition to that, we've got not one, we have one magnificent inland port here. We rode by it on the way up. Looking at it through the trees, it looks just like the port of Charleston with all those things stacked up, all those trailers. Magnificent. And all of these companies these business people who invested millions, even billions of dollars in our state, all say that that is a major factor in their coming here. And we're getting ready to have another inland port that crosses not 85, but 95 up in Dillon County. We, there's not another state in the country that's got a port, much less one good inland port, much less two good inland ports. That is off the scale for anybody else. What else do we have that these business people making decisions around the world see? We have the best technical college system and adjunct systems in the entire world. There's a lady from, you from the technical college, or Red ESC, one of y'all, yeah. congratulations. That's, what is, that's what's turning these people on because they know that we have in South Carolina, we've got the only such thing in the country, the only one in the country where if you have a plant or a business in another country or even another state, or if you have a major operation here and you need some help, you, you want to expand majorly, we will have a team go to Japan, go to uh, Germany, and we've actually done this over and over, and examine your plant, see what kind of robots and machinery, million dollars worth of machinery and big, big machines, see what kind of technical expertise and sophistication is necessary to run those and come back to our magnificent technical college system, which began in 1961, which some people thinking way ahead. And we will produce the kind of students and workers that you need to work in your plant. I say again, there's not another, not another state in the country that does that. We're the only ones, and we've augmented it with all sorts of problems, all sorts of other programs, including an apprenticeship program, we're off the scale. And the Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, not long ago in, in Washington, we were there announcing the opening of yet another uh, huge business, Samsung in Newberry County. He said, South Carolina is the model for technical education, apprenticeship, and sophisticated workers in these plants. That's the good news. The bad news is we're about 60,000 short of those jobs right now. 60,000. 
This is probably the first time in our history that we've had jobs looking for people instead of people looking for jobs. But the place that they'll be trained is in these technical colleges and all that goes along with it. We've been talking earlier this morning in the, in the other room there about pushing that down into the high schools. We have to take away, we have to have a cultural change to where the parents especially and the young people understand you can go to a technical college, that's higher education, you can go to a technical college for two years and you'll get out with virtually no college debt. You can walk into one of these magnificent plants and you can start off making anywhere from 55 to 60 to 75 thousand dollars a year and go on up. And if you want to get into management, then you, you can go online and finish your degree in English history or French literature or whatever it is you want to do. At the same time, you'll be living in a house that you just bought at 22 or 23 years old, making more money than your mom and daddy did, and you'll be doing exactly the kind of work that you want to do. It's, it's wide open. The future for our young people is wide open in South Carolina, but we have to have a cultural change understand that those jobs are A plus jobs. They're not to be looked down upon. They are what is in demand today and you can make good money and do something that you want to do. A lot of people would rather work on a million dollar machine making automobiles than reading French literature to a class in high school someplace. Just as one example. And anybody got a degree in French literature that's fine with me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying the world has changed. The people working in these plants today around our state don't carry toolboxes anymore, ladies and gentlemen. They carry laptop computers. And they are doing things that most of us in here don't have any idea how to do. It's sophisticated, it's clean, it's high tech. And we are headed for Brain Power USA. Is where South Carolina is headed. And part of that is the next asset, and that's our great research universities. We've got three of them, Clemson, USC, and MUSC. And they're different from others around the country in that they will cooperate with each other, and as is mentioned just a few minutes ago, and they will also collaborate with businesses. The ICOP is magnificent. It's off the scale. They're not doing that anywhere else in the country. At USC in Columbia, the uh, IBM National Data Analytics Headquarters, data analytics, very important, is on the corner of Blossom and, and Jervais, you know, Blossom and Assembly Street, right there in the USC building. Boeing gave five million dollars to the Aeronautical Engineering Department, and they have a, they actually have students, professors, researchers, and they're working on real parts of the airplane. There's nobody else in the country is doing that. Siemens, very big, cutting edge technology, gave $628 million worth of brand new software on engineering, art, aeronautical design, all that kind of stuff to the University of South Carolina. No gift like that's ever been made to anybody. We are right, we are right where we need to be. And these things are happening right here in our state. We have a right to work law. We have the lowest union participation of any state in the country. That's attractive to a lot of people. We got a right to work attitude as well as a right to work law. We got plenty of power. We run into, a, we got a situation where we have to do something concerning Sandy and Cooper and Scanner. As you know, they decided not to go forward with those two reactors. We have, but we still have an abundance of power for now and we're working on making a positive out of that negative. And uh, we hope to have some news of one day on that. But all these things that we have, they don't have in other states. Some might have one or two, but nobody's got that technical system. Nobody's got that port. Uh, but the, the other things, they have universities, but nobody has got all of what we've got. In addition to that, we've got the mountains up there, and we've got the coast down there, and you can get from one to the other in just a few hours. You can drink your coffee and read your paper in the morning and get the sands on the beach, and by evening time, but before then, you can be up at the edge of the Blue Ridge looking out watching the sun go in. You can't do that in all places. But the interesting thing to me has been statements that have been made in different ways by these executives of these big companies that have come from other places and see us in a way different from how we see ourselves. And that is it is best expressed by the chairman of BMW who was in Spartanburg for the 
event I mentioned 25 years anniversary of BMW, where by the way, as you know, it's one brand new vehicle, it was 61.7 seconds. It's hard to get your mind around that, but that's what's happening in Volvo's cranking up. I mean, we just, we produce more vehicles uh, uh, by value for export than any other state. We produce more tires for export than any other state. I mean, we're at the top. Charleston, South Carolina has been listed numerous times as the top tourist destination in the United States and several times as the top tourist destination in the world. People are coming to places like Greer, like Greenville, like Spartanburg, like Hartsville, like Columbia. Columbia is experiencing a revival. Everything is happening. Everything is happening right now for us. So what our job is is to not is to not mess it up. To realize that we're we in paradise and we have the asset that really excites all of these executives when they incite selectors when they come to look for a place to invest hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. And I assure you those decisions are not made lightly. And that is the peak. It is best expressed by the chairman of the NW, as I said just a few uh, weeks ago when he said, South Carolina, he said, I've been to many states, I've been to many countries, he's from Germany, Frankfurt, I think, he said, I have never seen what you have in South Carolina. South Carolina is a handshake state. That is when the people of South Carolina, whether they be workers, business, business people, or political figures, or whatever they are, when they give you their word, when they shake your hand, you can count on them. You know they'll do it. They'll work, they'll be loyal, they'll be resilient, they'll learn, they're smart, they're dependable, and they're trustworthy. He says there's no place else like that. So how we got to be that way is a question of history and geology. We've come from a lot of different places. We've been through all the ups and downs that man and nature has to offer. But here we are, and we have people from other countries that are all saying the same thing about the people of South Carolina. You just can't create that overnight. I have friends that come in from other states and they say, I can always tell when I'm in South Carolina. I don't need to see a map. I don't need to see a sign. I can tell when I'm there. How do you tell? Say, well, I go, for instance, to eat breakfast down in the hotel. And between getting my order and getting my bill, the waitress will call me honey, sweetie, darling, and dip. And probably hook me on the way out of the room. That's something that just doesn't grow on trees. It takes generation after generation after generation. And these people that are coming here, we need to take a lesson from them. We need to realize how strong we are. We need to realize how proud we are. We need to be sure we don't mess it up by raising taxes or having too many regulations strangling businesses about hurting each other. But we need to be proud of what we've done and take a page out of the understanding of these others who look at South Carolina Look at the people of South Carolina and say, as that great philosopher and country music writer Tim McGraw said, I like it, I love it, I want some more. Love it. <laughs> and they love it, South Carolina. That's my story, and thank you for inviting me.